Hello, everybody. How are you? My name is Christopher Sheely. I am the Producing Artistic Director for the Fine Arts Center Theatre Company at Colorado College, and I am thrilled to be here today with my friend and colleague, Elise Santora. Uh, you may recognize Elise from a handful of productions in the past, including, let's see, Curious Incident. Guana in the Tropics. Guadalupe in the Guest Room. And Elf. And Elf, most recently <laughs> Elf. <laughs> Uh, where there was a little uh, Devil Wears Prada happening on stage. That's right. Uh, she also directed In the Heights last year, which mm -hmm. uh, I know many of you saw because it was one of the more successful productions in the company's history. She is now back uh, again to direct the current show, which is Water by the Spoonful. Welcome so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, tell, so, so after all of that, uh, of your point of connection to us. How about a little bit more about you and how about something interesting? So like I know you've had a whole career <laughs> in, in, in everything. Well uh, that's the funny so. thing. It's like career sounds like planned and uh -huh. um, my journey as an artist has been anything but. Um, I started as a dancer on Soul Train. I wound up being a backup vocalist for several years for acts like David Bowie and then I went back to school and said, I need to train as an actor because I didn't want to stay in the recording industry. It wasn't my initial dream. Um, and then after that, it was like just doing theater since then. And in the last few years, it's been TV and film. So I feel like I'm really just basically your lunch pail actor and <laughs> been able to make a living out of it. And uh, when I started here with the first show of Anna in the Tropics, um, and then after that, Curious, it, I just built a relationship with this theater. It felt like a home theater to me, a place where I could have my voice heard, either being in the show or directing one, um, because I felt the love and the support and the, um, the establishing of excellence that I wanted to be a part of. Mm -hmm. And at this point in my life, at my age, it's, it's really great to just be able to be somewhere and be uh, feel like it's fruitful and mm -hmm. joyful and all about the work. <laughs> I, I, I and all of us appreciate that. Um, here's here's a, a follow up to that. Mm -hmm. What's a what's something interesting that our general audience wouldn't expect to know about show business? Like, because you know everybody assumes it's glamorous. Yeah. And it's 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 you're, everything's about fame and you're drinking champagne all the time and you have. You have people rubbing your feet and a trailer <laughs> yeah. and all of the glamour. And choosing and your white M&Ms. Right. Yeah, <laughs> That's right. Like, That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and so when, when we do tours, backstage tours, and talk with people, they're always astonished to learn th the details. But from a, from a performer point of view, what, what would you say is a, an interesting tidbit? I think what's unique to us as actors is that we, we are our own instrument. So I don't think... I, I think sometimes the audience can appreciate, but I don't think they really know how much work it takes from your body, your mind, mm -hmm. your spirit, your background on each and every role that you take. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of work is, uh, doesn't feel exhausting because we, this is what we do and we, we love to do. But at the same time, um, I think the biggest angst uh, that they don't know is that you spend a lot of time trying to get a role all the exhaustion really comes from the in between the gigs mm -hmm. so and there's so much work involved in that that people don't realize mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. getting new headshots every three years when your face changes or um <laughs> or your hair changes um and um and you know sending out the cards and going to auditions you're not right for and you know kicking with your friends over dinner and finding out about this workshop that you really need to put your resume into. So really the, the, the striving for the job mm. is the more exhausting part mm. and the one that takes so much work. Mm. Once you have a gig, you almost feel like you're on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love that. And yeah. as, as somebody who's been in theater most of my life, not as a performer, I sort of see that, but I'm always, you were speaking and I was thinking, Wow, I don't think I even appreciate that as much as I ought to, given that most of my friends are actors. <laughs> yeah, right. That, that's interesting for me to hear that. Right. And, and the other thing is, too, that you have to maintain the balance 
uh, which audiences might not be aware of entirely, between, and, and this happened to many a hip hop artist, which is that you have to balance between being the artist and taking care of business, because ultimately it is show business. Mm -hmm. You have to take mm -hmm. care of yourself. You have to make sure that you're getting paid your worth. And that's more and more difficult to do as the industry has gotten more and more corporatized. Hmm. So there is that balance that you have to find to be able to financially take care of yourself and be smart, um, but also be able to do projects that you wish to do. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, how about, let's talk a little bit about the show. Mm -hmm. When did you first become aware of the trilogy and of this, sh of this piece of Water by the Spoonful? Well, I was interested in Kiara's material since uh, I did In the Heights on Broadway and in the tour. So, Because she, she wrote the she book, wrote the book for, Heights for Heights. And yeah. also this play. Right. And so um, I started to get familiar with her other work. And, uh, and then I went to see the, uh, well, first of all, the play was nominated and won the Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. And it was extraordinary because of the fact that they gave it to the play before it was performed, mm -hmm. which had never been done before. That's right. And then I, I think, um, I would have to, you'd have to fact check it, but I think it was 2011. I did go see a performance of it mm. um, and I was bowled over by the text. Uh, it was so economical and yet so full and vibrant and um, poetic at times, considering the themes that it's mm -hmm. uh, addressing. And I had like three friends in it and they were extraordinary in it. And I thought, wow, that's, that's a play I'd be interested in doing mm. or being in. Mm -hmm. um, and then it just didn't come back around till now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. When you approached me about it, I was like, yeah, that's definitely something I want to get into. Which is a good segue into, can, can you, and, and you know, it's, it's hard to summarize. It is. This mm -hmm. piece, I, I've been doing it for a year. Yeah. And I feel like every time I try to talk about, describe what it is. You do I'm a different talking, version, I'm doing right? a different version. Yeah. <laughs> and also, I'm like, how much time do you got? Because right. do you need the like three sentence pitch or do you have a half an hour? Yeah. Do, uh, you, do you need the two hours it takes to do the play? To, like, yeah, no that's one. right. Because right. it's, it's deep. There's a lot. But can, can you sort of frame it for folks so they have a... Have, have some context for what it's about? Sure, so picture this. It's um, 2009, and uh, this young man has just returned from the uh, Iraq War uh, with PTSD. And he comes from a lower income neighborhood, but when he returned from the war, he wound up in this dead end job at a subway shop, which is what many veterans find themselves not being able to use the skills they, they acquired in the war to be able to use them here and they wind up in these you know, bare minimum wage jobs. Um, his cousin Yaz is his ride or die and there's a history there that develops throughout the play. Then on the other end you have an online chat room. Um, Odessa's the head of it and there's certainly colorful characters in this and this chat line, this chat room is designed for those who are trying to stay in recovery from either crack, cocaine, or heroin. And Odessa being the head of this chat room is trying to basically conduct what you would uh, experience if you went to an NA meeting. Mm -hmm. And as the play progresses, you meet all of these people, but then by act two, you start to discover the connections between these people. And in essence, the play is trying to show you how when families fail you or when community fails you to, and, and those are your two basic forms of support as you grow up, we, we always seem to search for created community, mm -hmm. especially when we want to heal from something. And everyone in this play is trying to find at least a pathway to healing and they do it through created community. Hmm. That, that's, I think that's that. That's pretty good, actually. Yeah. That <laughs> makes me want to go see the show. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what? So um, w w 
there are so many themes that run through yeah. it, but what, what, what would you say spoke to you the most? Like what, what was the thing you really wanted to key on or was there one? There wasn't. I mean, I, you know, um, there's a great quote by Maya Angelou where she says, I'm going to paraphrase here. Words are the thing. They stick onto your clothes. They get in your, they get in your purse. They walk, you know, they stick to your shoes and hopefully they get into you. And often what I said in rehearsal to the actors was that the text is not happening to you, it's coming from you. The, the text is so visceral because Kiara, when she was doing her research, um, she actually visited online chat rooms and she thought that the, uh, the chatter on it was so thrilling and virtuosic and sort of like dissonant and, and radical. And um, she compares that and equates that with Coltrane, mm -hmm. who is a famous jazz musician who took jazz to a whole different place. And that dissonance and the democracy of chaos and how chaos can, if not a resolution, at least get you out of where you are to the next place is what the music does and what happens in this chat room. So for me, it, at first, my, my way into the play was the language, the words. They, some of these lines in the play just stuck to me. PTSD and drug addiction is something I grew up with. Um, <clears throat> I lost three people in my family to the Vietnam War, and uh, the third one was the only one that came home, and there were some PTSD issues there uh, when, during the Vietnam War, that wasn't even labeled as PTSD. Mm -hmm and they were just given drugs, uh, comparable to morphine or heroin. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there was so much suffering, not only on the part of the veteran, but the family. And I was a kid, but there were no conversations that were able to help anybody process this. Mm -hmm. And I also had family members who were addicted, and I actually got to experience someone who was jonesing for the next fix and they couldn't get it and I was trapped in a room with them. And so it, you know, as a kid, of course, all of that is very over overwhelming, but at the same time, as I grew up and saw more of it in different circumstances, financial and otherwise, I felt like it was really a disease and not being treated as one. So this play sort of lets you watch people who don't have that kind of support, try to create it for themselves. So that's the hope in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what about, uh, tell me about the casting. It's very, has very specific needs. Yes. And uh, challenges. It I'm does, clearly. it does. I mean, <clears throat> when I first started. Which start by the way, your casting was fantastic. Thank you. It's a terrific, terrific, group of humans and really talented. Well, I grew up with the, uh, the the adage in show business when I was growing up and it was, you know, 90% of success is the casting. <laughs> um, and this play is difficult to cast for several reasons. One is it required specific uh, ethnic uh, groups. So you have, you know, three that are Latino, you have an African American who's in his mid middle age, you have a 30-something uh, uh, white man, and then you have a Japanese American. Um, so yeah, you have already built in things. My process was, I watched a lot of self-tapes, um, and then I just started to really hone down on what specifically these actors had that I knew I could take them more easily into the roles they were doing for such a short amount of time because we only rehearsed for two weeks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's another thing audiences don't know yeah. is we put this together very quickly. It's um, Chris and I have often talked about how it's magical and courageous how we do this. Um, and a miracle <laughs> when you get to opening. And sometimes a miracle. How did that happen? How did, did that we happen? we do that? We did yeah. that. We okay. did that. We did that. Um, so basically, um, I, I, I had some of the people that I have in the cast are um, two of them I, I have directed in, in the Heights, and I felt they had the potential to do a straight play. 
Um, another one I've done two shows with as, as, a, as an act, peer actors, and I knew she could get there. Um, my only two unknowns was um, uh, Robert, who plays Elliot, and Giuseppe Jones, who plays Toots and Ladders. Uh, but I saw enough on the self-tape and also on the callbacks that said to me, they have all the ingredients for me to take them on this path. Uh, so how about then uh, one of the challenges and people, everybody's going everybody's gonna to find this out when you come see the show because yeah. everybody's coming because yeah. <laughs> you have to see this. Yeah. Uh, the, the production elements are quite unique they and are. a little unexpected. And I don't want to give away everything. <laughs> I do want to say it's like Broadway. It is flashy and bold and the choices are amazing. The creative team was fantastic. Mm -hmm. What was that process like? It, it, how much of it could you see in your mind as mm -hmm. you read it versus how much did you share with the set designer, uh, Lex Liang, who uh, is a frequent collaborator here and very talented. Were you giving him words and he fed that back? Did you see any of the set in your mind? I didn't, uh, I didn't see it in my mind quite the way he put it on paper. Um, for sure. I mean, I didn't have the specifics, but what I said, so Lex Liang, who's incredibly talented set designer, um, we only had one conversation uh, when I first got together with him and he wanted to hear my thoughts. And my thoughts were basically that I wanted to be able to have the audience really feel uh, viscerally and visually the distinction between the online world and the real world. So you have the chat room, and then you have all the things that happen in the, on the street, at the subway shop, the church. Um, and I wanted, I wanted that entrapment. Um, so we talked about, so his feedback to me was, oh, like cubes. And I was like, that'd be great, because in, in, in essence, what that does is it traps the actors mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. in almost like they're in the screen as opposed to talking to the screen. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt that that was gonna add to the discomfort of the actor, because they're literally not talking to each other anyway. But on top of that, the way that the set is designed, um, they're just literally talking to a scrim um, and having to hear the actors through a monitor. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different way of working, and it made them uncomfortable, and I just kept saying to them, discomfort is good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it right. belongs in this play. <clears throat> yeah. Because people who are in recovery of any kind or have PTSD, um, they, they don't have transitions. It's spark plug behavior, but also it's every moment. They're having to consider every moment mm -hmm. of discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so essentially what Lex has done is he's created the, this beautiful set where we have pods that, that look like the, the each person's individual living space, but it's just small enough that you feel like they're mm -hmm. just on the screen. And then we have <clears throat> three platforms and uh, the rest of the stage to play out the real world scenes. And so it gives the audience, and we have projections, which gives mm -hmm. the audience a feel and a vibe of where we're going into every scene. Mm -hmm. So it kind of leads you gently and then knocks you out. Uh, with the scene because the scenes are very intense and fast paced mm -hmm. and uh, no apology, mm -hmm. you know, no apology for language behavior or where they're at. And I kind of wanted, and I, I want, uh, I told my production team essentially that I didn't want the audience to breathe very much. I wanted them to feel like after the two hours, like have to spend time to digest. <laughs> Uh, that that then leads me because so I feel like sound and lighting and projections yeah. were sort of one as they came together. True partnership. Yeah, and and in the room really, if you saw Travis Wright and um, Nita Mendoza is the so Nita is uh, the lighting designer and created the content, mm -hmm. and then Travis is the sound designer and implemented that content. And yeah, so watching the projector. Them the, yeah, yeah, watching them in the room, they were they were one and the same. Yeah. But I, what I find really compelling about their work is it what they are able to do in the transitions. Mm -hmm. it, it's fascinating because it is a palate cleanser. At the same time, it's the fastest palate cleanser you've ever had. It yeah. comes at you, <clears throat> and then you're like, oh wait, we're back. Yeah, we're back. Was how quickly did they come to? 
to that. You've you've collaborated with both of them before. Well, to Nita, some degree. Nita was the lighting designer for Guadalupe that I did here. That was the one show we didn't mention, I think. Oh, maybe not. Yeah. Guadalupe, Guadalupe in the guest room I did here. And um, I asked you right away if I could get Nita as mm -hmm. our lighting designer because I loved the lighting she did for our show. Yeah. Um, Travis and I had worked together uh, within the Heights. He was my sound designer for that. And I just found that relationship so productive because he almost finishes my sentences or I just have to say one word and he already knows what the note is. Um, he has this amazing technical proficiency married to a tremendous aesthetic. And Nita is the same way. And so once they learned how to speak to each other um, in one of our tech days, we, we were off to the races. So it's been a really collaborative and, and very creative, because I, I have a tendency, I don't know how other directors do it. Myself, I treat my production team um, as a bunch of artists I've put together. Mm -hmm. And so I let them go with what, you know, not whatever, but like I let them go and create and design. And then we have a collaborative conversation about what works. And, and a lot of times I depend, pardon me, I depend on what they are designing to then bring into the rehearsal room as opposed to the other way around. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, and that, I, I just want to touch briefly then on Oriana Sophia, yes. who's our fabulous costume, costume designer. designer. Mm -hmm. And what I find really compelling about her work, especially in this show, is the storytelling. The really, the really subtle storytelling, mm -hmm. it's not heavy handed at all, but no. really very mm, thoughtful. Very, yeah. It feels like a character and like, yes. or it feels like she's trying to be one with the actor and creating that character. She, um, uh, again, Oriana Sophia, I worked with her in, in the Heights as my costume designer and I was so happy she could return for this. And the reason why is she's so, um, incisive. She, she so thoughtful about what a person is wearing at any given point in time. And, or, and she's great about, you know, having thoughts and then texting me and saying, what do you think about this? And then she'll tell me the reason. It's not that it just looked good. She's just not dealing with just costume design, but the moment that that character is wearing it and what that means, et cetera. She was very careful because we have another character we haven't mentioned. Uh, which is, uh, prof there, he plays a dual role of Professor Aman and the ghost. Um, the ghost is, has been named the ghost, but it's really, um, it's really happening internally. It's a physical manifestation of what's happening internally within the PTSD that the main character, Elliot, experiences. And <clears throat> so now we're talking about having to find the legitimate clothing for an Iraqi man. And she was very careful and methodical about that. Um, we talked a lot about whether things like, does he wear the prayer cap? When does he wear the prayer cap? I mean, those are really subtle things that maybe the audience can't take in because they're, they're busy taking the journey. But what's great about it is that it actually adds to the journey. I was looking at <clears throat> one of the characters, Odessa, and I, she was laying a certain way on the stage, and I saw her foot just laid, just posed, and I thought, ooh, that needs a tattoo and a toe ring. <laughs> and Oriana was thinking exactly the same thing when I went to go tell her. And so it's just been a really great, it's great to work with people who are not just thinking about design, uh, they're thinking about, you know, how dramaturgically they can you know, fit that in. Yeah, and the storytelling that is the is, storytelling, yeah, is clearly there in their work. Um, how? Uh, let me ask you. And this is this is a difficult question. And um, wh what would you? What do you want audiences to take away? Uh -huh. And especially those like I've seen now a number of of dresses, and every time I'm finding something new. Yeah. So most audience members are gonna see it once <clears throat> and they're gonna find a point of connectivity. What, what is it you, would, you hope people, people come away with or, or feeling or experiencing? What's the goal there? Well, the goal is exactly what you said. If they can just experience one point of connectivity before they leave, we've done our job. Um, there's another quote, I'm gonna murder. <laughs> <laughs> it's from Aaron Sorkin who I really love his love his writing obsessed with his writing and um 
I, I can't quote it. It's it, because I, I need to paraphrase it. Basically, it says, um, you know, the time that we ask for you to pay attention, our obligation as artists is to entertain you. And if we hit on the truth, it's cream. Mm -hmm. So I'm not trying to be vague. I think that I think I can't dictate for the audience what they connect to. And some people can connect to three or four things. Mm -hmm. Other people can just connect on one line. Um, other people connect to the story. Other people leave the theater and don't connect to it till like two weeks later. Mm -hmm. They have a conversation with a friend. So you can't dictate that. All you can do is, you know, be be brave, be a little dangerous, be mm, be open to like throw these things on the stage, tell the story, and hope that people are at the very least moved. And then the best thing would be moved and connected and continue to have a conversation, either if it's about a recovery or grief. There is a lot of grief, um, or the idea of community um, or the idea of home. What is home to you? We've, you know, if you created one, do you still have the one you started with? You know, all those conversations are worth having because I feel like the pandemic stilted that communication. As much as we tried to connect with each other on Zoom, which was uh, quite a burden, <laughs> <laughs> we are all trying to work and communicate and we were with our loved ones and we lost loved ones we haven't truly processed the extraordinary crack in the planet that happened for two and a half years so it feels to me that if theater can actually serve the purpose of cracking that just a little bit for everyone to be able to process something whether it be grief whether it be uh the the, the loss of oneself the loss of something that that they had pursued before the pandemic then we've done our job. That, that feels like a good uh, place to mention that uh, all, all of our, uh, you know, we have a lot of military members mm -hmm. in our community here. Mm -hmm. And for this production, we, rather than the normal military discount, for this production, <clears throat> active and non-active personnel uh, receive tickets at 50% off um, all great. of their tickets. So that uh, we're hoping that that's a, point of access for them should they want to to come and experience what is a challenging show but also very healing in some ways and and so we I wanted to plug that so that um, everyone knew that they were very welcome in this facility and that's amazing and I'm so grateful that you're doing that because again I just want to bring around full circle how um, it's the families you know, mm -hmm. you wonder how much support they get. You know, the ones that are sitting here waiting for their loved ones to come back mm -hmm. from, you know, this 20 year war we were involved with or the things that are coming up that we're not sure of. Mm -hmm. Because the, when I was asked previously, why is this play important to do now? And I thought to myself, well, it's important to do now because it, because it, it came now. Like, I feel like, um, just as I've always felt as an actor, that a project comes to me when I'm ready to do it, even if I don't think I am, I always get the projects that I'm supposed to be in, uh, that you are, that it's time for you to be in this, right? So I feel like the same thing happens with how random or serendipitous it might feel that Colorado Springs decided to do Water by the Spoonful. It's not, because the context is the thing. This world right now is in much turmoil. The Middle East and, you know, the election and all of these things that we try to get up in the morning and compartmentalize and then wonder why we're exhausted by the end of the day. So I feel like this play sort of gives this opening door to be able to, for the military families, to have conversations that they might not ordinarily have. Um, and for the veterans who I hope will come, um, it's been suggested to me that it might trigger them in some way. And it's like, but there is a lot of support that is built into the military now that has never been there before. <clears throat> and this play does end on a hopeful note. Not that we tie up everything because life doesn't work that way, right? And if it does, 
I would be scared. <laughs> but it's, um, it gives you a sense of that these people have gotten to the next step of going towards the light or, you know, some kind of healing. And, and I would want these families to sort of engage in that and have that discovery if they don't have it already. I love that. Um, well, as you and I have spent countless hours countless uh, <laughs> chatting and clearly can without any trouble at all, uh, we should probably draw this to a conclusion because we sure. have a dress rehearsal. Coming That's right. We do. Shortly. We do. Uh, we, we, we have two previews this week on Thursday and Friday, mm -hmm. the 15th and 16th. Mm -hmm. We open on the 17th and run for three weeks. Um, I guess I guess I'll take this moment to say thank you. Uh, I think I think the show is fantastic. I can't imagine anyone else directing it, and and I can say a very specific reason why. It's a complex show, mm -hmm. requires uh, a lot of um, a management of emotion and mm -hmm. tapping into emotion, yeah. and when it's appropriate and when it's not, but still also bringing the funny mm -hmm. and the enjoyment, and and I think it could easily go to a very dark place mm -hmm. or a very scary place. Um, you could lose track of what's important inside it. And you, you, you are a human being who can, are capable of all of those emotions. Mm -hmm. And so that, that made you sort of the perfect person to direct this. Um, Thanks. And, and as I always say, if you don't know Elise, you should, because I'm never <laughs> happier than when I'm with her. Thank you so much thank for you. doing this. And thank, thank you. you so much for helming the show and doing such a lovely job. I love you. I love you too, and I encourage everyone to please come and see this beautiful piece. Um, it's just a joy ride. For e it should be a joy ride for anyone to come, just come and see theater. But then when it actually gives you a story that's worth telling, it's an amazing experience to have that I would love to share with you through Water by the Spoonful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.